everybody, welcome to Inside Quest. We're the school of management for your mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can help you engineer a better brain. And if you're looking to scale up the excellence of your intellect, there's no better guest than the man joining us today. Full of weird ideas that work, he's made a name for himself by deconstructing the qualities that make for great leaders and great organizations. A high octane bundle of intellectual energy, this man's work is dense with the kinds of usable insights that will leave any growing leader weak at the knees. Couple that with a wonderfully mischievous mind and willingness to stray from the dry path of traditional academic writing and it's easy to see why he is considered one of the most influential management gurus on the planet. Prolific in his content creation, the Stanford tenured professor has written over 100 articles and chapters on topics such as innovation, leadership, and workplace dynamics. And he has a massive social following that would make even the most thirsty teenager jealous. Over his career, he's won numerous domestic and international awards, including the Eugene L. Grant Award for Excellence in Teaching, the London School of Business Sumatra Gashi Award for Rigor and Relevance, and multiple best of awards for his peer-reviewed writings, including a nod in 2006 for his book, Hard Facts, Dangerous Half-Truths, and Total Nonsense, which was crowned the best business book of the year by the Toronto Globe and Mail. He was also named by Business Week as one of the 10 business school all-stars who are influencing contemporary business thinking far beyond academia and selected by Business 2.0 as a leading management guru. Please help me in welcoming the co-founder of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and the Hassel Plattner Institute of Design, the author of multiple New York Times and Wall Street best-selling books, including The No Asshole Rule, Good Boss, Bad Boss, and most recently with Huggy Rao, Scaling Up Excellence, Getting to More Without Settling for Less, Robert Sutton. All right. Robert, thank you Thanks. so much for being on the show. Great introduction, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for making researching you such a joy, especially at this stage in our company's life cycle. Literally, scale is the thing that oh. we struggle with most. It, uh, it is very prescient for us that you've written this book, which took seven years, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Yeah, well, uh, we, don't, we have less time pressure than you do. <laughs> when you, <laughs> that may when be you're, true. When you're building a company, you've really got to move. But yeah, it did take about seven years. Now, one of the things that I love about not only uh, scaling up excellence, but in all of your stuff, is it's really incredibly useful advice, which is, is the highest compliment that I can pay to any writer, consultant, anything, is that, hey, this stuff is actually usable. You can implement it and get a, a certain result. Now, I have a theory about scaling up that I'm currently testing under live fire, by oh, the way. Yeah, I bet, yeah, I, uh, I bet you are. I, I've seen the numbers. Yes, which that all of scaling comes down to changes at the individual level. In your book, you tell a really awesome story, which I'm sure we'll get more into later, of General Ridgeway in the Korean War, uh -huh. and what that can look like for a leader to make change. But at the end of the day, if he isn't able to get the individual soldiers that he was trying to rile up, if he couldn't get them to make change, then all is lost. So one thing that I'd love to see if we can pull off uh -huh. is to talk about the lessons in your book as they will ultimately apply to the people that have to enact them within any company. Sounds great. So how do the lessons of your book, and we'll start specifically with scaling up, Okay. but how do the lessons in your book, specifically uh, how can they be applied by an individual to, from a selfish perspective, to make them better in their own career? Well, it starts with two things. One is um, something I know you're a huge fan of, which is essentially mindset. Yes. And uh, either selecting people, uh, uh, kind of getting them cranked up. I, I'm a big believer in brainwashing, by the way. People yes, don't, don't use that which you term. you talk about in your book. And, and so wonderful. one of the key things about individuals is getting people where they have shared beliefs, the way we put it, is this notion about what's sacred and what's taboo. And that's one of the great things that Facebook did to grow really quickly. And it, it just amazed me that their mantra was move fast and break things. Right which worked really well into, until recently. What have they changed it to now? Uh, move fast and ship love. But, it, okay. but it, it got them to over a billion users and uh, hundreds yeah. of billions of dollars. Wow. Think about how, how much Facebook has grown. Uh, literally weeks they'd add 20, 30 million users and they'd have to hire engineers like crazy. So that's one, this idea of, of it really does help when everybody has agreement about what's sacred and taboo, mm. because then and one of the main things for leaders like you is you don't have to watch them as close because they know what the right thing to do is wherever they are. For sure. And so that's one thing. And the second one, uh, which is really a key thing, when we see great organizations, a lot of it is designing it so 
Uh, frankly, you don't have to monitor, watch them, and measure the hell out of them quite so much to create a world where they feel obligated. They, and the way we put it is, I feel like the place owns me and I own the place. So, so if, if I'm doing something wrong, uh, you feel obligated to stop what you're doing and to stop me and vice versa. And that also creates a teaching culture, this question, this, this sort of mutual obligation uh, that you see. And, and by the way, my favorite uh, leader in the world, it's probably Ed Catmull of Pixar fame. Oh, so, yes. so Ed's uh, president of Pixar and president of Disney Automation Studios. And the, the most beloved CEO you ever met and probably spent more hours arguing with Steve Jobs than any living person. Maybe Johnny Ive is close, <laughs> but a lot of time arguing with him. And, um, and, and when you walk into Pixar, there's this sense of everybody feels so much pressure and pride mm. to do a great job. Uh, and, and just as an example, at Pixar, the security guards and the receptionists are all full-time uh, Pixar employees, and they will tell you whether the next movie is any good or not. And they will feel pride if it's good. Wow. So, so Ed's done something at Pixar. No kidding. His book, Creativity, Inc., was absolutely amazing. Oh. I took a lot out of that book. Absolutely incredible. So I think that's the best creativity book about how to build a creative organization, the best one ever written. Yeah, it's so. very, very powerful. Now, I want to go back sure. to your concept of brainwashing. It's sure. near and dear to my heart. Oh, I love brainwashing. Um, so... <laughs> Talk to me about the hows of brainwashing. So I, I understand, I know you use Facebook as a great example, so we can just drill deep into that. Um, but what are they actually doing, right? So you show up. What they do is they create a world where that's how everybody acts. When you stray from the way things are supposed to be done, uh, you know, it's one thing to fool the boss like you, but when everybody is holding everybody accountable for it, it really works. So you're saying I'm much easier to fool than they are. That's the well, it's just the pure story. numbers. Is the, the pure numbers is that you, that you can't watch all of them, but they can all watch one another. Can't I? Yeah. So, well, <laughs> I, I don't depend so good your data are, but to me that's where it's going. And one thing that I would emphasize is this is one of the reasons. In some ways, we're talking about really strong culture organizations. When they auger in, they really auger in because everybody is all doing the wrong thing in perfect lockstep. Yeah, it's, um, it, it is so incredible to see how you can get a massive group of people moving to the beat of the same drummer. Right. Um, one of the things that I want to do, because these guys are really going to interface with it twofold, same with anybody watching this. So uh, part number one is just the hows of getting to that. So I'm going to take away from the things I've read directly. Um, is repetition, right? So if you want people to move fast and break things, yeah. you need to go in and say, we move fast, we break things. You make them repeat it, right? I was just out in City of Industry, which is where we manufacture our product, uh. and we were giving them the repeatable pieces that our, our director of knowledge and training is smiling. We're giving them the repeatable pieces of information, right, that uh. can be transmitted through the tribe so that as as it's taught to you, so you teach it to somebody else, right? And, and it, it's digestible enough and easy enough to remember that it can be disseminated very, very quickly. So that's part one, but creating the mm -hmm. environment where you can act in accordance with those beliefs other than having the leaders do it, I don't have a lot of great and this is how you do it. Um, what insights can you give us in terms of the how of of actually making sure those first uh, key stakeholders, influencers within the company take hold with the appropriate behaviors so that they can spread? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. And, and to your point, it's, it's not like you, like you get everybody on the same cultural page in the same skills once and then it's done. It's something that as the company evolves, you've got to do things to change. And, First of all, the worst way to do it, let's start out with the worst way to do it. Um, and I get paid to do, help do this sometimes, which is that I would give you a speech about uh, how to scale excellence or something that's very near and dear to my heart is design thinking, which is a kind of customer focused creativity. And I can give you a speech, I have a PowerPoint deck. We could, we could talk about <laughs> what you should do. I could, I could tell you all sorts of things that you should prototype and you should be customer centric and, and, and uh, you should do to think I can tell you all these things and it'll have no effect on you at all. Uh, <laughs> Not the punchline I was expecting. I'm sorry, though. but what you do is you create a small pocket of real excellence, mm. and, and then you get those people really kind of cooking, 
and then you get them to infect the next people, the next people, the next people. And, and just to give you an example, one of my heroes is a woman named Claudia Kochka, and this is back in 2000 in Procter & Gamble, but uh, she was brought in by um, then CEO A.G. Laffley, also the current CEO again, and said, we've got to be more customer focused. And they realized this because they sold Folgers, because they did uh, surveys of young people who said they would never drink coffee and then uh, this little company called Starbucks came along to prove them wrong. Right. So they weren't, they weren't very customer focused. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. Sure. And check me when I get crazy, add on where, uh, where you think needs. So one of the most profoundly impactful stories in your book for me was General Ridgway. Oh, General Ridgway. Um, so for, for those of you that don't know the story, um, please bring them up to speed because this is, it is a truly amazing story. Essentially, he gets, he gets sent to Korea and, and, the, and, and uh, the U.S. is losing horribly and they're actually getting ready to pull out. And, and, and they're gonna, it, it, thousands of casualties. And, and what he realizes is one of the reasons that they're losing so horribly is everybody's afraid to go out of, out of their foxholes mm -hmm. and go on patrols. And so they have really bad information. So essentially, he would uh, force them to go out on patrols constantly, and he wouldn't be in the back lines. He'd be in the front lines. And, the, and his famous thing is that, is that he would walk around with a first aid kit uh, to show how take care of you get hurt right. and his gun to, to be on the front lines. One other thing that he did, when we see turnarounds, you're lucky you're not in a turnaround situation yet, but one of the first things that happened is you got to get go in and move out the cancerous people. The right. people are incompetent, the people are afraid. Yeah, it, what I found so powerful about the story mm. is as, as a leader, uh -huh especially somebody who does not consider himself a born leader. I'm not a born entrepreneur. This is all stuff that I've had to learn. And one of the quotes that I came across of you is leadership is learned. And that's something I really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But so as somebody who has that sort of belief, leadership is learned. It's not like people are just sort of innately that. Mm -hmm. Maybe some come to it earlier than others. But as you get into a position of leadership and realize mm -hmm. little things about what people actually want from you, what's actually effective as a leader, it's hilarious. So you would think that uh, General Ridgway, let's say that he were, you know, 6'5", 240 pounds of muscle, nice square jaw. You would think those would be all the things, right? Just sort of the archetypal. But in truth, what it was was the guy was, A, he was prideful and he had righteous indignation. Right. And he was pissed. He was pissed. And he, he goes, what is going on? Like, Excuse me for a second, I, and I am definitely like sort of this is my fantasy land of how it went, but what the fuck is going on, right? You guys are turning tail and running? Who do you think you are? Like, we're Americans. We don't come and get our asses handed to us. Simple as. And he would go to each regiment. And if you were like, yeah, we, dude, we got to bail, on the spot, he would relieve you of command. On, right there. Thank you, you're done. Because you can't lead from a position of weakness. That realization for me, that what people really wanted in me was confidence, was certainty, like that's all people need. He had confidence and certainty. And then he was willing to strap the first aid kit and a grenade, was how you wrote oh, it in sorry, the book. Sorry. First that's aid kit and a grenade to his back to let people know the two things, we're here to fucking fight. And he said, get me a small plane and fly it low and slow across the battlefield and I'm going to put myself in harm's way every day and I'm going to show these people, number one, you can't be afraid and advance. Your problem is the reason you've got the bad information is you're not getting out of your foxhole. That's weak. And so he went and inspired confidence in them and showed them what it means to be prideful, showed them what it means to have righteous indignation, that you're not going to back down, you are going to move forward, you are going to push these people back, and that shit, like, I know what I'm doing to your brain chemistry right now, and if I said, we're getting up now, and we're gonna go kill somebody, we would all jump up and we would do it, right? <laughs> because that's what we want, you guys like, we can do it. hunger for that shit. <laughs> this man is gonna be right out front. <laughs> I'll put the grenade in the, the thing on his back. <laughs> but like, as you realize the things that separate anybody from the sort of people that are remembered by history 
it, it is not things that are innate. It's not things that are born. It's nothing that you couldn't do yourself if you just make that decision. So I'm reading this story. It's giving me the chills. And I was like, whoa, I know exactly what we have to do to solve. Because the scaling problems we have, we essentially have two businesses, right? Uh -huh. I've got the managers, and then I've got the people that make the product. It is two totally different universes. Ah, classic. No one here wears a hairnet. Everyone out there wears a hairnet. It's hairnets and lab coats. It's physical labor. It's very physically taxing. And that, that divide of trying to uh, bring the pride and righteous anger to, to both groups. But there's a couple of things going on there that I think are really important from a, a, a leadership perspective, uh, scaling in particular, but a leadership perspective in general. One is, uh, if you, when you're in a leadership position, if you don't act like you know what you're doing, you're dead. But there's another um, negative underbelly. If you believe your own bullshit too much, you're dead too. Right. And, and so this is one thing you mentioned, uh, some of my work with Jeff Effer, when we look at really great leaders, and this, in, uh, Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, sort of just um, go down the list of people who are, who are great leaders. Essentially, they're confident, but not really sure. So, so, so what <laughs> That's happened- a line from Tom Petty? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so so what, they, what they do is that, um, that they have the confidence to say, this is what we're gonna do, this is the direction we're going, but they're always looking for signs they might be wrong. Sometimes backstage, sometimes looking at the data, Definitely. sometimes going in by themselves. And there's always this combination of, of confidence and humility. So, so that's one thing to remember. It, it, it's one of the th hard things about being a leader is you actually have to act like you're in charge. It, otherwise, people start freaking out and, right. and, and won't follow you. But then if they keep seeing you in situations where you're leading them a direction, well, they all get shot every time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, yeah. they, and you're not learning. So, so to us, that's one of the most interesting sort of things. So, so yes, I want a confident leader, but I want somebody who actually uh, doesn't make the same mistakes over and over again because they're so pig-headed. And it's really a complex, uh, it's really a complex line to walk. Yeah, which you write about really, really well, and I think really cover it, you, you cover across it in three books, at least the three that I most deeply encountered. Um, Certainly the no asshole rule, right. right? Talking about how the toxicity of being an asshole one comes to be, uh, but that there's also, God, what was the chapter on Steve Jobs, the advantage of the asshole? Well, there are some advantages to, well, Steve Jobs is such a complicated case, but, but, but the, the advantage of, of it is that it does sort of arouse people. Mm. Um, the disadvantage is that you leave them feeling like dirt, demeaned, de-energized, and they get sick. And, uh, you mean sick, literally phys sick. Physically yeah, sick, yeah. mentally ill. The way I think about it is the, is the most effective assholes do it strategically. And um, it's not, so people tend to say, oh, he or she's an asshole or not, right? The best ones do it strategically. In fact, one of my colleagues at UC Berkeley, his name's Barry Stott. So honestly, we started talking about this study 30 years ago, Whoa. maybe 27 years ago, about strategic temper tantrums. So, what the data show, because you just finished analyzing it, um, is it's, it, it's, it's a bunch of uh, data of halftime speeches um, it, for, by basketball coaches, both men and women basketball coaches, college and high school, and they looked at temper tantrums. And it turned out that the, that the coaches who screamed all the time doesn't work. But if you're somebody who usually doesn't scream and you lose it every now and then, it can show you the point score go up the next half. So this idea about knowing when to show the flashes mm. of anger is, is very important. And one thing about Jobs, which Jobs was pretty out of control in some ways, but he was very good about being strategic. So certain people he would seduce, essentially. So the two people in the world who thought Steve Jobs was the nicest person on earth were Walter Mossberg and David Pogue, who were the leading technology writers of the time. They just thought he was the sweetest man. And, uh, and Larry Page, who got screamed at and belittled by him, who he wanted to make him feel, so, so Steve could be very strategic when, with his temper tantrums and his love and, and uh, dislike. So I love in your writing how even handed you guys are acknowledging that, okay, being mm. an asshole makes people sick, but there's times where people want that <laughs> um, certainty. How can a, a developing leader, how can he learn that balance? Is it literally just trial and error and that's the best we're ever gonna get? Or is there, are there other things they can look well, at? Well, um, in the world of entrepreneurship that you're in, mm. uh, uh, sorry, folks, but what, ha what has to happen is you get these fast growth situations, 
and you see people make mistakes in public and all you can do is keep trying and keep learning and that's by the way that's one reason that I really do um, admire Mark Zuckerberg so much honestly and I won't name names but uh, we had a lot of information about him because he was in downtown Palo Alto when he was 21 years old mm. and uh, uh, it wasn't very pretty. The, the movie's wrong, by the way. Uh, it, Sorkin seems to have no real interest in facts, so the movie's basically <laughs> wrong. But but he was not the smoothest, nicest person to work with. But he's just got be better and better and better over the years. And so what's he's all? He's or 31 or something now. I mean, give the guy, mm. guy a break. But the amount he's learned in the last 10 years is absolutely amazing. So. So that's one of the things about leaders is I, you can't do what you do without making mistakes. The question is, are you actually learning something? Right. Yeah, that's a powerful question. Uh, and I'd love to know, do you have, is there a mechanism by which people can check themselves? Because you talk a lot about um, one of the worst things that a leader does is shut down the people that follow them. They completely lose touch with what it's like to report to them. So now they're essentially flying blind. How can you solicit the feedback to make sure that you're learning, implementing new techniques, and that you're actually getting the result that you want? So it is interesting that, that having somebody in your life who can tell you you're full of shit is incredibly valuable. So, so yes, when, when people come into your office and do criticism or you hear of criticism, the way that you respond to it is very important because if you shut them down, it's a, it's a problem. But if you look at people who are um, successful, very often, it, it, my colleague Kathy Eisenhart at uh, Stanford who studies uh, actually did some real interesting stuff on successful versus unsuccessful founders. Uh, essentially what she would find is somebody in their orbit who would tell them that they were full of BS. Sometimes it was somebody who was on the board, who, sometimes it was a friend, and then my colleague Huggy Rao is trying to put together um, a couple of data sets, and his theory is, is that, uh, is that people who have a spouse, basically, who can tell them they're full of BS. Uh, oh, is she here? She is. <laughs> Oh, good. Right back there. Can she do it? Oh, she is not shy, my friend. Okay. Oh, good. Well, you're good for you. Um, so real fast, let's go back to the brainwashing thing for a second. Because okay. you mentioned something that I think is really, really powerful. And I think mm. that it's very difficult for people. So first of all, to, to explain why I want to go back to that, dovetailing off what he said about learning, uh, that you have to try, and some of what you're going to try is going to fail. You need people that can give you the feedback. Now, obviously, the, you guys as leaders and then the leaders that you guys report to, um, you've got to build that trust. You've got to earn that trust. Uh, so, and I fully understand that. But that really is critical to um, not flying blind. And it is so dangerous. Like one thing that um, you talk a lot about in the book that JFK did. There's some other famous leaders that do it. Um, and that's to, in the middle of a meeting, once they know that it's going well, they'll leave. Because they know their mere presence in that meeting will cause a shift in dynamic in that meeting that's True. not necessarily positive. So understanding the, the desperate need for there to become a very symbiotic, very somewhat intimate relationship between uh, the people in your subgroup within the company for sure, because you'll know them, there's a lot of face-to-face -face interaction, there sort of has to be that commitment. But now to bring it back to the point that he talked about with brainwashing, when you're dealing with people and you want to give them that feedback, when you want to say, um, this company belongs to me, I belong to it, you're acting out of accordance with the agreed upon uh, sort of tribal statements, how do they give that feedback? How do they receive that feedback it's, if it's being given to mm -hmm. them as a matter of training, we'll say, because most people, they just get defensive, right? So are there strategies they can use to lower their defenses as sort of a, an intellectual system that they're following? Well, it is interesting. Some of, it, the, uh, of this is cultural. This is one, and, and, and not just cross-culture from different countries, but we come from different families with different norms. And this is why, and I talk about in the book, this notion that, uh, that, the, that the, the definition of a good boss is, um, I know what it feels like to work for, for me, I know right. what you feel like. And some people come from families where you actually can be pretty firm and go at it. It won't really bother them at all because right. they grew up in a family like I do where everybody yelled at each other. Some people come from families, let's just say, that are more passive aggressive. And, for, and if it's somebody like that, you, it, then what you've got to do is have a calmer, more rational, more gentle conversation. Mm -hmm. And so, so the affect 
you really have to understand what gets the person's attention. And, and there are huge differences, both national culture and also just we all have different psyches. So to me, that's part of it. Yeah, that's, um, that gives me the cold sweats to think about training people to deftly read other people to understand sort of oh. culturally where that person is coming from, um, how this is going to come across. Well, one um, thing that, that makes that, that makes me maybe I'm from Silicon Valley, where because and I also teach in the engineering school, not the business school, and uh, we as, a, as an area do not have the best interpersonal skills on earth. <laughs> so one thing, one one thing I think that helps is like if you go up this much higher, you're so much better than your competitors. It's unbelievable. Right. You know the the old joke that the uh, the expert engineer looks at your shoes rather than their own shoes. So that's sort of like what you're trying to get to. Right. <laughs> so, 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 so you got to look at, so, you know, business is competitive. You got to figure, right. uh, figure out where you stand compared. And, right. uh, so anyways, wow. I don't know your funny. industry, but. Uh, yeah, well, this, uh, God, is it, it is partly our industry. Our industry obviously is very body conscious. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of, of outgoing personalities, uh -huh. people that want to engage. And we built the company socially. So we sought out the okay. most socially uh, people that are just super hungry for that connection. And that's one of the values that I think we bring is mm -hmm. that we're actually trying to connect with the people um, that we touch and whether that's just through great product or great customer service or whatever the case may be like we really want people building relationships and you and and look it's no accident if you look at what Zappos is doing uh -huh. I read delivering happiness before we started this company and in many ways having read that book gave me a vision of how a company could be very very successful um, and not use any of the traditional sort of beat people to death and and just yeah. constantly like chip away at efficiencies and things, but rather say, how rad is the customer experience, right? And let people fall in love with that, which meant we had to hire people that could potentially fall in love with that. And that's mm -hmm. something that I really like that you cover a lot in the book is that a lot of getting the right people in your company is just hiring right. Oh yeah. Um, and looking for people who hit uh, or fit the cultural value. So we look for three things and the third one is compassion, which is maybe a little bit weird, but that for us, because like I know, one, our products are editable, which means they're already incredibly intimate, mm -hmm. right? What you eat is a very intimate action. And our products are designed to help you live a better lifestyle. So this is somebody that's, they've got a goal now in their head of what they're trying to do. So it's intimate and vulnerable all coming together um, to do something exciting. So that's something that we try to really get people excited about, find people that just sort of have that natural inclination. Um, but finding ways to really institutionalize that is, is what makes your work so fascinating to me. Well, let, let me talk about compassion because compa compassion is important for you, but I, I think it might even be more important you know, with doctors. At least I want a compassionate doctor. And, uh, and most, especially surgeons are like, as a, as a group, they're just terrible. It is interesting that the, the one place that I've been involved with that actually has compassionate surgeons is the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. And uh, one of the things they do at the Cleveland Clinic is uh, you can be from the most prestigious medical school and you can be fabulous, but uh, they have everybody on sort of short-term contracts. They pay them very well, but, if, but they don't just look at uh, their surgical outcomes and how much money they bring in, because with surgeons, they do keep track of how much mm -hmm. money they bring in. If they don't fit culturally and treat their teams and patients with compassion, out. Right. So, and the interesting thing is that that's unusual in medicine, by the way, so to make you nervous. So, 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 so that's, but that's using the same selection criteria you do for surgeons. Right. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to bring up that you talked about that I think is really important. So we all know, we're, we all need money, money motivates us, I like money, money's like a wonderful thing. But if you look where people do great work, and it's funny because you keep going back to them it directly and indirectly, uh, collective pride and collective anger are wonderful things. And if you look at what um, great leaders do, while, while money is important, and this is one thing Huggy really emphasizes, my co-author, when, when people start thinking, we're going to do something great together, or we're really pissed off at them, we're going to beat them, one of the main things that happens is their individual self-interest falls away mm -hmm. and they start doing cooperative things to help each other regardless of the reward system, almost regardless of, of how selfish they are right. in a natural situation. And that, by the way, is, uh, you know, Jobs had many weaknesses, but, but the one thing you look at both Apple and you look at Pixar, his two great treasures, those are places where people do things because we're proud that we did great work right. together. 
And, and Apple's still like that. So, so I, I really, and, and when you get pissed at people uh, collectively, it, it, it helps too. I mean, having, having that competitor to get mad at does help. You ready to get really weird? <laughs> sure, let's get weird. Have you read Mein Kampf? No, I have not read Mein Kampf. I lost a few relatives as a result of that. But yeah, so, <laughs> as, as, so my background's film. So at one point I was writing a screenplay about a guy that starts a cult. So I was researching all these people that have started cults. And of course, one of the most unfortunately impactful cults um, was Nazi Germany. And so he goes, Hitler goes to prison, right? Uh -huh. Before World War II, he's uh -huh. in prison and he writes a manifesto called Mein Kampf. And he lays out exactly what he's gonna do and how he's gonna do it. And it was so terrifyingly accurate. Uh -huh. Like here was a guy who, and so I'm gonna bring Nir Eyal to my defense, a guest that we had on Inside Quest who said, a superpower isn't a superpower unless it can be used for evil. Right. So the, the psychological principles that he used, they're superpowers, right? He just happened to use them for evil. Um, but understood, you know, Germany's in a weakened state right now. Nobody has a sense of pride. It's kind of like the U.S. over in Korea. Mm -hmm. And what they need is they need a strong leader to come in and tell them to paint a picture of how things are going to be positive. And one of the key elements of that is going to be they need, um, they need someone to galvanize around the, as being the enemy, right? And so... Uh and, and, it and works. It, it is so terrifying how well it works uh, and really does make you sit back and question, am I doing the right thing? Because these are incredibly potent techniques. Um, have you guys seen cases where, and I guess you were alluding to it earlier, that, that it can end up in a crash, but have you seen cases where people um, create an environment that ends up sort of souring over time, but they, they're getting that way by being highly efficient at the, the things you should do in order to galvanize the team. So actually, I can name one because it's in the book and it's publicly available. Uh, there was a point where British Air was so pissed off and wanted to get Virgin so much that uh, they started doing things like, uh, uh, and I may get the facts slightly wrong, it's in the book, they hacked into the database and when people tried to, uh, tried to get seats on Virgin, they would make it impossible for them and then they also spread a rumor that Richard Branson had, uh, was HIV positive, had AIDS. And so, wow. so that's where it starts getting a little bit ugly. Yeah. But, but to talk about it, what does, but to talk about backing it off, and, and we do talk about this and scaling up excellence, is uh, one, of the, one of the amazing things, and Jobs really was good at this. When he got back to Apple, uh, and you're, most of you are from the generation that you won't even know this, the company was on the verge of going bankrupt. Um, I, I still remember, they, they had crappy products, in fact, they had about 70 or 80 different pieces of hardware. And after he'd been there for a year, all, four, all, all of them were gone and they had all four new products and that was it, which is, that's quite a transformation. Get rid of 80 products, go to four. But he starts walking around and what had happened was that Michael Dell had said, uh, if I was Steve Jobs, I'd shut down the company and give the money back to the shareholders. And Steve, and so one of my friends, John Lilly, who is a now venture capitalist, was working there, and, and Steve was giving talks to the company, fuck Michael Dell. He wants us to shut down, fuck him. We're gonna go out and we're gonna show him we're gonna kill him. And he did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Dell still exists, it's still a big company, but nothing compared to Apple. And uh, that's that, that sort of enemy. And, and, and there's the, the Michael Dell, uh, you know, Steve Jobs' enemy ship goes on. There's even some resort in Hawaii that Steve loved that uh, Michael Dell owned that Michael wouldn't sell him. I mean, it's like they just kind of just wow. went on and on. But, uh, but, but, but that stuff, it, weirdly, it works. Yeah. Why do you think it works so well? Uh, I, I think it, the sociologists who study this, they talk about in-group threat and out-group solidarity. Mm. If you think about it, you know, when the other tribe would start attacking us, it was pretty adaptive for our tribe yeah. to act that way. So if you had one tribe where they'd say, oh, they're attacking us, oh, they're okay, they're good people. We'll, we, we don't have to fight that hard. Right. But if they're just really these <laughs> evil, horrible people where you just want to kill them all because they're like subhuman and they're horrible and they're right. stupid. I mean, it's not a good thing, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, that idea about getting a little bit of collective anger without going absolutely insane is not right. a bad thing. That's why pride's better, by the way, because pride, you don't have to hate anyone. Ed Catmill, if I compare Ed Catmill mm. to, to Steve Jobs, Ed n never talks about anger or despising anyone. 
he just talks about we're going to do great things together. And that's one reason why he's a more universally beloved person than Jobs right. is or was. It's, it's interesting, the, so the power of that, to go back to Jobs, the thing that scares me is how the putting it back into the context that you put it of evolutionary pressures and the groups that really responded is when the, the groups within a company, they say 150 is about the natural limit, right? And you can't be part of a tribe right. that's bigger than 150. So even take a company like ours, right? So between part-time and full-time employees, we have over 2,000 uh, employees. So you can already see within our own company, we're going to have like all these fractured um, tribes within the greater tribe. My fear is that one tribe in the company views another tribe in the company as yeah. the outsider to be battled, right? And so now you've got to worry about internecine battling and like trying to, you know, manage all that stuff. And so in his book, <laughs> you're so honest, I love it is that, yeah, every now and then you just got to put the hammer down, right? So it's like you get these people that start bubbling up conflict or whatever, and at some point to eradicate the vacuum of power, somebody has to step in and be like, this is how it's going to be, but then has to walk that balance and of not. Well, well, well so, so I, I guess I'm a believer in sort of a combination of, of bottom-up and top-down, that, that, that sometimes you do have to put, put the hammer down, but there are other things that you can do uh, one of the things, some organizations are terrible about this. Yahoo used to be horrible about this. They've gotten better. Is that uh, they create reward systems, uh, cultural standards where the enemy is us, it's not the outsider. That was one thing that Jack Welch that was right that is sometimes lost in the mix is he was very clear about how he defined a superstar. That was somebody who not only did great individual performance, but who helped the company as a whole succeed and, and people in other businesses. Tell that, um, the example from the men's warehouse, because I thought that was particularly Oh, the powerful. old men's warehouse story. Yeah. In the George Zimmer days, the way it used to work was, when you walked in to buy a suit, uh, you'd have a person who would get the commission, so it'd be you, but everybody else was supposed to participate in the team selling environment. Mm. So this guy in the Seattle, one of the Seattle stores, their top salesperson in all of the area, and um, constantly was bad-mouthing the team selling environment and wouldn't participate, so they kept warning him, kept warning him, superstar, so they fire him. Um, after they fire him, the sales in that store went up 35%, even though no individual person was a star like him. And I think that's a pretty good um, analogy. Now, there's some times when maybe having um, no, when there's no interdependence or cooperation needed at all, it might be okay to do things like that, but you gotta be very careful because what we tend to do is we tend to focus on the stars in organizations. Mm. And it, actually, if you look at the evidence, it's the, it's the people who are not the stars that really matter. And since it's the baseball playoff time, there's some great uh, studies of, uh, of, of the effects of pay distribution in baseball teams. And it turns out that uh, teams that have a smaller difference between the top half and the bottom half do better. And really? the reason is, is because of the performance of the bottom half. Mm, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, for us especially, and I think it really speaks to a basic human need. Everybody wants to feel significant, right? right. Everybody wants to know, ah, this is my contribution. And not everybody's going to be able to lead their group. And not everybody wants to lead their group. But I think everybody wants to feel significant. Yeah. Um, and, and that part of my personality really responded to that men's warehouse story. Right. Oh, yeah, it's great. Because you're yeah. just picturing this asshole, right? He's not helping. He's making it hard for you to make a sale. And he's smiling the whole time because his sales numbers are great, right? And you just want there to be some sort of comeuppance for somebody like that. And so to see him get removed only to see everybody else shine right. so much more that the entire store is doing better. Really, really phenomenal. I love that. Um, I'm going to ask a really random question. You wrote a book called Weird Things That Work. Yeah, Weird Ideas That Work. Weird Ideas, yeah. What's the weirdest idea that works? The, the basic idea of the book is that the logic of routine work and innovative work are different. So in routine work, you want to drive out variation. You, 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 you want everybody to look at the same thing as everybody else. When you, when you, when you do innovative work, you want to have variation. And, and uh, that's where um, good things come from, lots of failures. That's why uh, Elon Musk always talks about the more I'm failing, the better I'm doing, as long as I'm not dead yet. I mean, right. he says stuff like that. Um, but, but my favorite, probably weird idea is think of something that don't work. Uh, you know, make a list of like the worst ideas you can think of 
and then pick one and try to make it work. Like the stupidest, dumbest ideas that, that you can think of. And there's actually a story in the book, and it's been so long I can barely remember it, but there was a guy who worked at Microsoft, uh, a young Stanford grad, and he worked in sort of in the, in the toy department, the stuff for young kids. And what they did was they brainstormed the stupidest idea they could come up with for a kid's product, and it was actually a talking Barney doll that taught you mathematics. They thought that was the stupidest idea you could come up with. Um, then three years later, two years later, <laughs> Microsoft came up with the exact same product that they, and it was actually quite successful. It wow. sold about a million units. And, and, and as he said to me, I said, so what do you think about the fact that it came out? I said, I'm not gonna take credit for that piece of shit. <laughs> but it sold a million units. Yeah. And so, and it, it, more realistically, it is interesting on the variation side, when you have something that's really out there, um, at Pixar, uh, when they, they talk about going from things that suck that don't suck, and they say that if you, the worst thing is to come up with a mediocre idea. The best thing is to come up with things that are extremely bad because they tend to be out there and then to turn them into something good. So, so very often in their brainstorming about new projects that the, the mediocre ideas are the ones that they throw out before the really, really crappy, really, really stupid ones. So that's, that's, uh, that, that's a, a culture that sort of gets that too. Yeah, that's actually really fun. Bob, thank you so oh, much. Oh, thank you, that was so much fun, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Guys, if you haven't yet, you wanna get deep into this man's world, the books, the blog articles, the tweets, everything, his talks, they're absolutely incredible. So do yourself a favor, drop his name into YouTube, you're gonna find just a, a wealth of amazing stuff. Uh, he even breaks down some of his talks into infographics, which you can find on his Twitter feed. Utterly phenomenal. He's got uh, just amazing collaborations with some other just amazing, amazing writers who he also does talks with. You're gonna wanna watch them all because it's usable. And that is really the key takeaway for me uh, in everything that I was learning about uh, his works is they were immediately applicable to me, to Quest, to what is going on right here, right now. It's one of the freakiest uh, experiences I've had in terms of exactly the issue that I'm dealing with in my life and the guest on the show. Uh, the more I research him, the more I learned about it. It is all amazing. There is not a, a wasted paragraph or word or even comma. It is utterly brilliant material, so be sure to check it out. Uh, if you aren't already following uh, him on Twitter, which you can find him at, Work underscore matters. Work Working underscore matters, matters on matters. Twitter. So check it out. You're going to want to follow him there. Is there anywhere else other than Twitter? You're pretty active on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm slowing down a little bit. I, I think Twitter's probably the best place to follow Twitter's me right now. Twitter's the way. All yeah. right, cool. So be sure to check it out. If you're not following us, it's at Inside Quest. If you're not following me, it's at Tom Bilyeu. And if you want to get shows or tickets to be here in the audience, be sure to do so. You can write us uh, at InsideQuest.com and click on the Get Tickets link. And then we will have you in this beautiful audience who's about to get to ask this man questions. So there are advantages. But again, Bob, thank you so oh, much. This for is being wonderful. On the show. Thank Absolute you. Pleasure. Thank you. Guys, it's a weekly show, so be sure to subscribe. Until next week, be legendary. Take care.